In this lecture, we are going to study the concept of transient response and observe the influence of the pole locations in the temporal response of a system. This is a very important lecture, and the subsequent lectures will all be based on these concepts. It will build upon the idea of Laplace transforms and the decomposition of a signal into exponential and sinusoidal waveforms. As we saw in the definition of the Laplace transform, the Laplace transform is simply a way to recreate a signal using a combination of these sinusoidal and exponential waveforms that are given by the location of zeros and poles of a transfer function. In this lecture, we're going to study in more detail how the location of the pole determines the shape of the temporal response of a system. By the end of today's lecture, you should be able to make a connection between the Laplace transform definition and the transfer function, and understand the concept of transient response and how the poles of the transfer function affect the temporal response of a system. Consider this example. The rotational velocity of the satellite is adjusted by changing the length of the beam. How can you determine that the shape of the transient response? Consider, for instance, that the satellite is rotating at a given speed, and then a step input is given to the system to change its speed to a new speed. The speed will now move to the new speed, but will follow this transient response. What is the shape of this transient response? Is it a sinusoidal waveform? Is it an exponential waveform or a combination of them? Consider now a robot gripper that is controlled using a DC motor. How can you determine the transient response of the gripper's position? Consider that the gripper is operating at a constant position and then is given a command to go to a different position like this. This is the desired position. If you now plot the actual position, the actual position will follow a transient before it reaches the new desired position. How is this transient? Is this transient an exponential waveform, exponential and sinusoidal waveform, or is the system even unstable? The answer to this question can be found by looking at the transfer function between the gripper's position and the commanded input. Before we address the topic of the effect of pole locations in more details, let's go back to the last lecture. A transfer function is defined as a ratio of two polynomials of S, where B and A are the coefficients of those polynomials. For real systems, the degree of the denominator is always greater or equal to the numerator, but never the other way around. The zeros of the transfer function are defined as the values of s that satisfy n of s equals to zero, where n of s is the top of the equation. Thus, at the zeros, the transfer function magnitude tends to zero. The poles are defined are the, as the values of s that satisfy d of s equals to zero, that is the denominator of the transfer function. Thus, at the poles, the magnitude of the transfer function tends to infinity. Consider again the same transfer function we studied in the last lecture. In this transfer function, we have two zeros, s equals to zero and s equals to three, here and here. And at these values, the magnitude of the transfer function tends to zero, as you can see in this three-dimensional plot. The poles of the transfer function are the values of s that satisfy s squared plus two s plus five equals to zero. And these are minus one plus minus one j. And at these locations, when s tends to negative 1 plus minus 2j, the magnitude of the transfer function tends to infinity. For this particular system, if you now look at a f of t, the inverse of f of s, what shape of that temporal response do you expect? Do you expect it to have an exponential waveform, a sinusoidal, or a combination of those? According to the definition of the Laplace transform, because here we have both a real and imaginary part for the solutions of s squared plus 2s plus 5 equals to 0, f of t will have an exponential component that is given by the real part of the pole and a sinusoidal component that is given by the imaginary part of the pole. Now we can start to see that there is a clear relation between the pole locations and the transient response of any transfer function. Let's get into a little more details by considering an example. Let's look at this RL circuit and let's consider two inputs, a step input and an impulse input. Through Kirchhoff's law, we can find this expression here that it gives a relation between the current and the voltage. And by rearranging the equation, we find the transfer function shown in the second line. And you can write that as a first order transfer function in the standard form by dividing both the numerator and denominator by R. And from the standard form, we get the time constant that characterizes the response to a step input of a first order system. Let's now consider a step input. For a step input, v of s equals to 1. We now replace v of s equals to 1 in the transfer function and so for i of s. The expression for i of s is given here, where again tau is L over R. The temporal response of the current for an impulse response is simply the inverse Laplace transform of i of s. Now let's look at the location of the poles of this transfer function. This transfer function has a pole at negative 1 over tau. 
because tau is a real number, then the pole is also a real number. And when you take the inverse Laplace, we get this expression here. Because the pole is a real number, we notice that the time response only has exponential components. And now let's place this pole on the S-plane. When tau is greater than zero, then the pole is a negative number and is located on the left side of the S-plane. If you now look at the temporal response for tau greater than zero, will be an exponential waveform that decays over time. The pole is located on the left half of the S-plane, and the exponential waveform decays as a function of time and tends to zero. Now let's consider a case when tau is less than zero. If tau is smaller than zero, then the pole is a positive number. And when you draw it on the S-plane, the pole will be placed on the right side of the S-plane. If now tau is a negative number, then this exponential here becomes positive. And when you plot the temporal response, the temporal response, the exponential that comes from the temporal response increases over time and tends to infinity. From this analysis, we can conclude that if the pole is located on the left half of the S-plane, this creates an exponential component that decays over time and tends to zero, or settles at a given time, at a given point. However, when the pole is located on the right side of the S-plane, that is, the real part is positive, then the exponential increases over time and tends to infinity. Now let's take the same system once again, but now let's change the input. Let's assume that the input is a step input. That is, we turn the system on, we turn the voltage on, and you leave the voltage on as time tends to infinity. The only difference compared to the previous example is that Instead of replacing V of S by 1, we replace that with 1 over S. So now our transfer function for I of S becomes 1 over S times 1 over S plus 1 over tau. Where again, tau is L over R. Now to find I of T, we need to take the inverse of I of S. And this will require partial fraction decomposition. Here is the partial fraction decomposition of the transfer function. Where K1 equals to tau and K2 equals to negative tau. Now it is simple to take the inverse Laplace, and here is I of t, the inverse of I of s. Now let's look at the pole of our transfer function again. Well, the pole hasn't changed. Now we have a pole at 0, but we still have the pole at negative 1 over tau. Well, if tau is greater than 0, then the pole s is smaller than 0. It has a real part is smaller than 0. We can now place the pole on the s-plane, and the pole will be on the left half side of the s-plane. If tau is a positive number, that is, the pole is located on the left side of the S-plane because the pole is negative, then this exponential here is equal to exponential of a negative t over tau. Tau being a positive number will result in an exponential that decays over time. This part of the exponential tends to 0, and i of t will tend to 1 over r. Now let's consider the pole again at a negative 1 over tau. But now let's assume that tau is a negative number. When tau is a negative number, then the pole is a positive number, has a positive real part. When you place the pole on the, ima on the imaginary plane, we'll see that it will be on the right half side of the S-plane, because it has a positive real part. If tau is smaller than zero, then this negative sign and negative sign from tau cancel out, and now the exponential that comes from this part of the inverse will always increase and i of t tends to infinity. To summarize, the first observation that we can make here is that the pole is a real number. There is no imaginary part. Thus, the inverse will only have exponential components. This is what we see here, only exponential component, no sinusoidal waveform. Second, when the pole is placed on the left half of the S-plane, the real part is negative, and the associated exponential decays over time and will converge, either to zero or to a fixed number. Third, when the real part of the pole is now positive, it will be placed on the right side of the S-plane. And because of that, now the exponential component associated with that pole will always tend to infinity and will diverge. From this analysis, we can see that a condition for a system to reach a steady state and to be stable is that the real part of the pole needs to be placed on the left side of the S-plane, it needs to be negative.
This analysis is only valid for first order transfer functions. Let's see if we can expand that to second order transfer functions now. Now let's consider the mass spring damper system again. This is a second order transfer function because the highest coefficient in the denominator is s to the power of 2. The standard form for a second order transfer function is omega n squared divided by s squared plus 2 zeta omega n s plus omega n squared. So first, to put h of s in the standard form, we need to divide the top and the bottom of the equation by m, and we obtain the second expression. Now we can match the elements with s to the power of 0 to find omega n, and the coefficients that multiply s, that is 2 zeta omega n here, and b over m there. From here we find that omega n squared is k over m, omega n is the square root of k over m. Remember that omega n is the natural frequency of the system. And from this matching we can see that 2 zeta omega n equals 2 b over m. And now by replacing omega n here and solving for zeta, we get zeta equals to b over 2 square root of m times k. Zeta is the dimensionless damping ratio, and omega n is the natural frequency in radians per second. Now let's give this system a step input of magnitude 1. We're going to apply 1 over s. This means that the force at time 0 goes from 0 to 1 and is maintained. If f of s now becomes 1 over s, we can solve for x of s by doing h of s times 1 over s. And this is what we obtain. 1 over s times the initial transfer function. And the transfer function here, for simplicity, is written in the standard form. Now let's look at the poles of this transfer function. The poles of this transfer function are the values of s that is satisfy s squared plus 2 zeta omega n s plus omega n squared equals to 0. We can now find the poles using the quadratic equation. Minus b plus minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2. And this simplifies to this expression. These are the poles of this second order transfer function as a function of zeta, the damping ratio, and omega n, the natural frequency. We have two poles. Here they are. One has a positive sign here. One has a negative sign. You have probably been wondering, why are we talking about zeta and omega n, damping ratio and natural frequency? Here is the answer to that question. If you look at the value of zeta here, we can see that depending on the value of zeta, now s1 and s2 can be complex or real numbers. And that will determine the shape of the temporal response. If zeta is greater than 1, then this results in a real number and the s1 is a real number. If zeta is smaller than 1, then this results in an imaginary number and s1 will have imaginary components. So depending on the damping ratio, the system may have only exponential waveforms as a response or exponential and sinusoidal waveforms. And what is omega n? Well, from this definition here, we see that when zeta equals to 0, s1 and s2 are purely imaginary numbers. They are located on the imaginary axis at a frequency of omega n. Thus, omega n represents the frequency of oscillations of the undamped system when zeta equals to 0. We'll come back to this later. Now let's go through all these cases that are discussed in the previous slides one by one. Here we have the same transfer function, and here we have the roots of that transfer function. In case one, let's assume that the damping ratio is larger or equal to one. That means there is lots of damping. We see that the damping ratio is a function of b, the viscous friction coefficient here. We can look at zeta as the amount of damping or amount of dissipation of energy in the system. In case 1, let's assume that there is lots of damping in the system, zeta is greater than 1. If zeta is greater than 1, when you replace zeta here and here, these two cells are now positive numbers, positive real numbers, which means that S1 and S2 are both real numbers. Because we know that all poles are real numbers, we can write that in this very simple format. There is no exponential waveform. When you apply a step input to this mass spring damper system, it will move following an exponential 
waveform without any sinusoidal component. Here are some examples. Let's take a mass of 1 kg and the stiffness constant of 1 newton per meter. And now let's vary B, the coefficient of viscous friction. We know that zeta, the damping ratio, is directly proportional to B. Now let's make zeta go from 1.5 to 1 and plot the time response of the system. For all these three cases, zeta is greater or equal to 1, so the poles are all positive numbers and you should only expect to see exponential waveforms. This is what we see here. Here we have the time response and here we have the location of the poles on the S-plane. We see that in this case both poles are negative real numbers, they lie on the real axis on the left side of the S-plane. As we start now to decrease the damping ratio by decreasing the viscous friction coefficient, the poles are coming together and you see that the system reaches the steady state value faster. Eventually, when the damping ratio becomes 1, both poles are the same. This is what characterizes what we call an overdamped system. The damping ratio is greater than 1, the poles are real numbers, and the poles are negative numbers. The time response is always going to be an exponential response and will settle at a given point. These two examples here are overdamped systems. Whereas this one is a little different because at this point zeta is exactly 1. When that happens we see now that the two poles become 1 at the same location and this is what characterizes what we call a critically damped system. In a critically damped system, the damping ratio is 1, the poles are real numbers, they are located on the left side of the S-plane, and they are the same. Now let's consider a different case where now the damping ratio is between 0 and 1. In this case, we have some damping in the system. In this particular example, the viscous friction coefficient in the damper here is smaller than in case 1. When zeta is greater than 0 but smaller than 1, then the result inside the square root here is a negative number, which means that the square root of the negative number creates an imaginary number. This part here now is imaginary. S1 and S2 have now a real part and an imaginary part. If you now take the inverse Laplace of something with complex poles, we'll see something similar to equation 11. And you see here both components, the exponential component and the sinusoidal component of the time response x of t. Now let's look at the time response. Once again, we are applying a step force to the mass. The mass will start to move with the displacement x, and what we are seeing here is the displacement for a given input f of s. F of s in this particular case is a step input, so the force goes from 0 to 1 and it stays at 1 at time t equals to 0. In this example, we have a damping ratio of 0 0.75 all the way to 0 0.05. For this particular system, we can change the damping ratio by changing the viscous friction coefficient. We see that between these examples, the viscous friction coefficient is decreasing. As the viscous friction coefficient decreases, there is less dissipation of energy in the system, and the damping ratio will also decrease. When b equals to 1.5 and zeta equals to 0 0.75, we have two poles, and here they are. We can notice that both poles have imaginary and the real parts, but the real part is negative. This means that the poles are complex conjugate numbers, with real parts located on the left side of the S-plane, with negative real parts. If we now go back to the equation we got in equation 11, we see that the exponential part here, because zeta and omega are positive numbers, will decrease to zero. So the time response is what we see here, a sinusoidal component with an exponential component that decays to zero. As b decreases, now the damping ratio is 0.5 we still have complex conjugate numbers with negative real parts. Thus, the poles are located on the left side of the S-plane. Again, this will result in an exponential and sinusoidal waveform multiplied together, and for this specific example, we'll follow this curve. Some oscillations that are damped out because of the exponential component, and eventually they go to zero.
and the system will settle at 1. Now let's decrease the damping ratio even more. Now the damping ratio is 0 0.25. We see that the poles are still complex conjugate numbers with a negative real part. Thus they are located on the left side of the S-plane. They are getting very close to the imaginary axis though. And you see that as we decrease the damping ratio, we can see the trend that the, the real part of the poles are decreasing and you see more and more oscillations in the time response. Here we have an exponential response and a sinusoidal response. The exponential is decaying to zero because the real part of the pole is negative and you bring the oscillations eventually to zero and the system will settle at one over K, which in this case is one. And the trend continues. If you now keep decreasing the damping ratio, we see that the poles are very close to the imaginary axis, but they are is still they still have a negative real part. That a negative real part is what makes this exponential decay to zero and bring these oscillations to zero and the system is able then to settle at a final value. In conclusion, when the damping ratio is greater than zero and smaller than one, the poles are complex conjugate numbers. The real part of the pole is negative. The poles are located on the left side of the S-plane and we can observe both exponential and sinusoidal components. Because the real part of the pole is negative, then these exponential waveforms will decay to zero and will bring the sinusoidal waveforms to zero, and the system will then be able to settle at a given time. This is what we call a underdamped system. Now in case three, zeta equals to zero, there is no damping. This is equivalent to removing this damper here. We now are left with a mass spring system. Again, consider the same step input one over s. When b equals to zero, the viscous friction coefficient is zero or there is no damping, then zeta is also zero. For S1, the pole is now located at omega n times j, and S2 is located at a negative omega n times j. When zeta is zero, there is no damping, both poles are purely imaginary numbers. We can now take the inverse Laplace of the resulting function, x of s, and we'll find x of t as shown here. We notice that indeed the temporal response only has sinusoidal waveforms and no exponential. This is expected since energy is transferred from kinetic to potential energy and vice versa. And in this process, there is nothing dissipating energy because there is no damping. In the previous example, we have a damping. So when the energy is transferred from kinetic to potential energy or potential to kinetic, in that process, we have some energy dissipation due to the damping. Here, there is no damping, so the energy goes back and forth between the spring and the mass indefinitely, and the system only oscillates. Here is a plot of the time response. It's only a sinusoidal waveform. The mass keeps going back and forth. It never settles. Here is the location of the poles. The poles are purely imaginary numbers. The real part is zero. There is no exponential. This means that the system oscillates and oscillates at a given frequency. And that frequency is the natural frequency omega n that is given by square root of k over m. This is what we call a undamped system because there is nothing dissipating energy. The system oscillates indefinitely and the frequency of oscillations of the undamped system is the natural frequency. Now let's change the mass and see how the mass changes the natural frequency. In the first example we had, the mass was 1 and the natural frequency is now 1 radians per second. Here is the location of the poles. If we now increase the mass, we are decreasing the frequency of oscillations. We are decreasing the natural frequency. When mass is 2, we see now that the frequency changes, the poles also change. They are getting closer together. And this trend continues. When the mass is now 4 kilograms, the natural frequency is 0 0.5 radians per second. The system oscillates at a lower frequency and the poles are now coming together. They are coming together along the imaginary axis. So again, the natural frequency is defined as the frequency of oscillations of the undamped system. Now let's consider a hypothetical negative damping. In this case, zeta is less than zero. A negative damping for this particular case of the mass spring damper system would mean that the viscous friction coefficient is negative. If you can think about a negative viscous friction coefficient, then you basically found free energy. So this is just a hypothetical scenario. In the first example, let's consider that a zeta is between negative one and zero. This means that as for the underdamped system, this square root here will result in a imaginary number. 
The difference now, because the zeta is negative, is that the real part becomes positive. We have two potential solutions. The first potential solution is this, when you have a sinusoidal and exponential components, when zeta is between negative 1 and 0. This now results in an exponential component that increases over time. The second scenario is when zeta is smaller than negative 1. Now, as for the overdamped system, these two parts here are real numbers. But once again, this other part of the equation here will now be a positive number. Positive number that will be higher than the second part. Thus, the roots of this system will be real and only have positive real parts. Because the roots or poles are real, then the time response will follow this format with only exponential waveforms. But because now the poles have positive real parts, both exponentials in equation 16 will tend to infinity. When zeta is between 0 and 1, we should see complex poles, but now they are located on the, on the right side of the S-plane. They have positive real parts. Thus, the exponentials now are increasing to infinity. And will also bring the sinusoidal waveforms to grow in magnitude towards infinity. When zeta is smaller than negative 1, then now we go back to the case where we only have real poles, but now the poles have a positive real part. They are now located on the right side of the S-plane, and the exponential that they create also tends to infinity. These two examples characterize an unstable system. They will never settle at a given value. Now let's summarize this discussion. We can see that depending on where the poles are located on the S-plane, that will define the temporal response of the system. That will define whether or not the system is stable, if it will settle at a given point, and how it will settle at that point. If it will follow an exponential response, an exponential and sinusoidal response, or purely a sinusoidal response. When the damping ratio is greater than 1, then all poles are real numbers, and they are located on the left side of the S-plane. This will always result in an exponential time response. When the damping ratio is between 0 and 1, now the poles are complex conjugate numbers. They have a real and imaginary part. The real part is negative, so the poles are located again on the left side of the S-plane. The real part creates an exponential response, and the imaginary part creates a sinusoidal response, and together they will create temporal responses like this one. When the damping ratio is zero, we have purely imaginary roots. The poles are located on the imaginary axis. There is no exponential response, only sinusoidal responses. And thus, the system will always oscillate. When the damping ratio is between negative one and zero, we again have complex conjugate numbers as the poles. But now the real part of those complex conjugate numbers is greater than zero. This means that the exponential component that they create will tend to infinity, and this will result in an exponentially growing sinusoidal waveform like this one. If the damping ratio is smaller than negative 1, the poles are real numbers with positive real parts. This will create again only an exponential waveform, but that exponential tends to infinity. When the damping ratio is greater than 1, we call those systems overdamped. There is significant dissipation of energy in the system that will maintain an exponential waveform. When the damping ratio is between 0 and 1, we call these systems underdamped because there are some oscillations in the time response. When the damping ratio is 0, we call these systems undamped. There is no damping associated with them. The time response oscillates. And when the damping ratio is negative, these systems here are unstable. We can now clearly see that for a system to be stable, the poles need to be placed on the left side of the S-plane. If the poles are located on the right side of the S-plane, the system is unstable. It will never settle. So long as the poles have negative real parts, the system will settle. It will follow an exponential or an exponential and sinusoidal waveform, but the system will settle. The condition, again, for a system to be stable is that the real part of all poles is negative. Here's again a summary of this discussion. Now let's consider the mass spring damper system again. 
When the system was overdamped, the damping ratio is greater than 1, and we start to decrease the viscous friction coefficient. These two distinct poles started to move towards each other, and they met at a given point. At that point that they met, the system has a damping ratio of 1 and is critically damped. If you continue to decrease the damping ratio, now they break away from the real axis and become complex conjugate numbers. And now they will travel towards the imaginary axis as we keep decreasing the damping ratio. They will do that until they reach the imaginary axis. And in this process, the system is said to be underdamped when they will have complex conjugate poles. When they reach the imaginary axis, the real part becomes zero and the system is undamped before it becomes unstable as the damping ratio continues to decrease. Consider again the poles we found for the second order transfer function. This will give the location of poles S, and you know that S as defined has an exponential component, sigma, and a sinusoidal component, j omega d. We can now equate here these two expressions and say that a sigma is simply zeta times omega n, and omega d is simply omega n times square root of 1 minus omega n squared. And this helps us distinguish the real and imaginary parts. We can now take s and plot that on the s plane. So here is s, the location of the pole. The real part is sigma, which is zeta times omega n. And the imaginary part is omega d, which is omega n times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. The magnitude of this pole is the distance of this vector to the center. That is the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared, the square root of that. And if you simplify this expression, we'll see that it simplifies to omega n. This distance here is simply omega n. Now let's take this angle and call this angle theta. Sine of theta is equal to this distance divided by this distance, which is simply sigma omega n divided by omega n. So the sine of the line that connects the pole to the center of the S-plane is simply zeta omega n divided by omega n. Sine of theta is equal to zeta. So theta is sine minus 1 of zeta. So when you place a pole on the S-plane, we are now specifying the damping ratio and we are specifying the natural frequency of that pole. The natural frequency is this distance and the damping ratio dictates this angle now let's go over some exercises, they'll be posted in separate videos.